Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate that. Dr. Jarman, um, I'd like an update from you on the non-response follow-up survey, which I understand has resumed in the field after its work in the fall. Uh, are you aware of any issues that might present uh, the possibility of an undercount, particularly in rural or underserved communities, communities hit particularly hard by COVID-19? Um, and can you give us an update on the NRFU process uh, this spring, please? So the, the non-response follow-up operation is done. Uh, it, it ended in mid-October. Um, with The field operation relative to the decennial census that we're undergoing right now is the post-enumeration survey. And I just got an update the other day. Our response rates are well over 90%. Um, and, and that is the survey that we use to measure the coverage of the survey. And that's how we know the degree to which um, some households were undercounted and some households were, were overcounted. Um, and so that, that work continues um, and will be done with field collection with that shortly and then begin to start processing that data so that we can then assess the, the accuracy of the 2020 census. Thank you, Dr. Jarman. And can you uh, explain for the benefit of the committee as well as state officials who may be watching and anticipating the data they'll be receiving, how states might use the legacy format summary redistricting data files uh, that would be sent in addition to the raw data uh, to support states redistricting processes? And um, what, what concerns for a fair redistricting process might result from the presentation of the data using the legacy format? So, so thanks, Senator. So the legacy format is much like what we produced in 2010. So many states will probably be familiar with it. I, I know that there's vendors out there that, that have used uh, the data in this format that have assisted the states in the past. Um, the final format, this, the data that will be released in September, is actually has more functionality. It, it'll, it'll come with built-in software um, that allows... Uh, folks to really drill down into the, the, the data in a much uh, easier, user-friendly way. So the, the data that will be released in August will be much like what was released in, in, in 2010. So folks that were familiar with that um, should find it familiar. But, but still, um, you know, the, the data we're releasing in September is what we've worked with them over, over this decade to, to make improvements. And so that won't be available until September. Thank you, Dr. Jarman. And am I correct that the household pulse survey is, is still ongoing online? You're correct. It is uh, ongoing. One of the concerns uh, is that communities that are on the wrong side of the digital divide, uh, particularly during COVID-19, where there's been uh, displacement, um, that communities without access to broadband internet, without access to computer hardware, uh, may have their needs, their voices underrepresented in a household pulse survey that's conducted principally online. I want to commend the Census Bureau for using technology in this way to get uh, what is vital data, but uh, ask what efforts you're making to ensure that there's not underrepresentation of low income, uh, technologically disadvantaged communities uh, when you're gathering the data in this way. Uh, so thanks, Senator. So, so like lots of our surveys, um, you know, even even if we were um, using a, a, you know more traditional mail based method, um, you know, we we often have um, you know survey non response, and so we use statistical methods to to weight the data so that it's it's representative of of the population as a whole. And we're doing that with the household pulse survey. But one of the considerations we had with the household pulse survey was. Um, you know, we, we favored um, getting the data out in a very timely fashion. And I think that's what drove the decision, um, you know, to go with a completely online type response option. We did the same thing with, with the small business pulse survey. These are both using, you know, sort of innovative uh, contact strategies, um, you know, either text messaging or emails um, and, and trying to get information really quickly. And so, you know, I think it's a trade off between how, how much you try to make sure that you get the survey in front of uh, various folks versus how quickly you can get the data out. And, and I think with the, with the poll surveys, um, we, we really, you know, tried to, to push things towards getting the data out quickly. Thank you, Dr. John. Appreciate that. And again, do appreciate that you're using technology and innovative ways to gather data more efficiently and more swiftly. And would you be able to share with the committee uh, if it's not already in the publicly available methodology 
the uh, process that you use to arrive at the weighting of that data, um, what the underlying statistical basis for it is and uh, the effect that it has taking the raw data and after weighting such data, uh, converting it into the published data. Could you provide the committee if it's not already public with that okay. information, please? If it doesn't already exist, we'll we'll, we'll get that put together and 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 make it available. Uh, you know, not just to the committee, but to the to the public. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Senator Ossoff. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, each of you for uh, being here today. Certainly, your testimony is uh, very important and an issue that we're going to continue to be focused on in the in the months uh, ahead. Uh, the uh, hearing record uh, will remain open uh, for 15 days until April 7th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions uh, for the record. And with that, uh, this hearing is now adjourned. <laughs>